Americans pride themselves on being civic-minded people, but for most of us, it's just that. Something in our minds. Civic duty is something we think about. We know concern. We consider participation, but seldom think of risk as part of our civic duty. Lewis Peters got a chance to do more than think about being a good citizen. He received the ultimate test, and what he did for his community and his country was, in the words of Patriot Nathaniel Hale, above and beyond the call of duty. The story begins here in Lodi, California, a suburb of Sacramento, at Lou's Cadillac car dealership. Lou was just a normal American businessman, doing a job, doing that job well, too. On a quiet afternoon, Lou sat down to tell the whole story to Roger Young, inspector in charge of public affairs for the FBI, an old friend of Lou and Marilyn Peters. And uh, over the uh, years, the 1970 through uh, 1977, we became very successful and, and was quite prosperous. And uh, it was uh, during the first part of June in 1977 when uh, a local contractor by the name of Elmer Birch came into my office and said, uh, Lou, I, uh, I have some people that want to buy an agency. And I said, it's not for sale. He said, but name any price. He said, they've got all kinds of money and, and they really want to buy your agency. And uh, after me saying no a couple of times, uh, I finally said, uh, $2 million. So uh, it was a couple days later he came back and he said, uh, they said the $2 million is okay. He said, it's, uh, he said, have you ever heard of Joe Bonanno, senior? And I really hadn't, so I, I said no. And he said, he's the head of the mafia for the whole United States. Well, immediately I changed my whole train of thought to negative to positive, because right away I want to know, what the hell does he want to do? Why does he want to come into Lodi? So I said to uh, Elmer, I said, uh, if I'm going to deal with these people, I'm going to deal with them direct. And he said, oh, OK. Well, he said, I'll set up a meeting. And so uh, I got into my Cadillac and drove to the chief of police in Lodi and told him what happened. And the first thing he said is, oh, my god, because he could see all kinds of problems. Mm. He said, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm going to the FBI. So I went down. Uh, uh, to the office, and they uh, ushered me into a, uh, one of their interview rooms, I guess. And then in came, I don't know, four to five agents. And uh, I told them the story. Then they had photographs, and I picked out uh, Bill Bonanno. Joe Bonanno, I wasn't too sure. There was enough shady characters there that I, I couldn't pick him out, because I hadn't spent that much time with him. His was just a, a brief interview, I mean, a brief uh, uh, introduction. So uh, then they asked me if I would uh, help them uh, gather intelligence information. And uh, I said I would have to think about it tonight, and I said I'll let you know tomorrow. And uh, so I called them and told them, yes, I would do it. I didn't understand why these people wanted to come into our county. Uh, and I just, uh, I wanted to find out. Because uh, I know from past experience that uh, once they get in a town, it's, uh, they're just a bunch of animals that take advantage of everyone and everything that they can. Lou, did you ever have any concern for your safety, any fear? In this operation? No. Never even thought about it. I, uh, I felt it was the right thing to do. And uh, I just did it. I was asked to help, and uh, I was more than willing to, to help the FBI. 
So I discussed this with uh, Bob Anderson, the uh, FBI agent in Stockton, uh, that uh, the combination they wanted me to to buy property and real estate, and uh, in order to do this, uh, I felt that uh, I should be single. I should also be single to uh, uh, so that I'd have a reason to move out of the house and get an apartment in Stockton and set up an operation in Stockton. And they, uh, of course, they said that's uh, impossible. You can't uh, get a legal separation from your wife. I said this. This is. Uh, you just can't do that. Uh, it's not expected. Uh, no one would ever ask you. And I said, no. But I said, I'm just stating what I'm going to do. And uh, came home and uh, told my wife I wanted a uh, legal separation. And uh, it had to be tough, though, when you came home and told Marilyn, here's what I'm going to do. What, what kinds of the, things happened that night? The hardest part was telling the girls. Uh, did you tell the girls why or just no. what? I just told them that uh, I was on a, a project and I had to be single in order to do this. And uh, Were you having any second thoughts? Wasn't it getting a little expensive in terms of time and effort? It, it got more expensive, but the, uh, uh, I, I could see that there was a, a tremendous need for this information for the Bureau. And I was willing to, uh, to sacrifice because I felt it was important, and I felt it was right, and uh, because we didn't want these animals in this county or in any county in the United States, but uh, certainly not here. So uh, we found a, Bob and I found an apartment uh, in Stockton, and he got the apartment upstairs, and uh, they were, uh, putting all this electronic equipment. Uh, they had the fireplace all torn up upstairs, and uh, they lowered a man upside down, down the chimney, uh, and built shelves, and put audio video cameras behind uh, the wall, and had uh, microphones in the walls. And they had two cameras set up. One was facing the uh, living room couch, and one was facing this dining room table here. Oh, this it was my dining room table in the apartment. And uh, so it was, it was quite an elaborate setup that they, we had in the uh, apartment in Stockton. And uh, Bob Anderson upstairs handled all the tapes, and uh, uh, he was aware of when the people were coming into my apartment, and he would activate the audio video and do all the mechanical uh, work upstairs. How was it in the apartment, Lou? You've been a family man. It had to be a little lonely after a while. Yeah, it, it was uh, it was many uh, lonely nights uh, that I spent uh, uh, in the apartment. But uh, as I told my wife, I said, look at it as if I had to go into the service, my tour of duty. Uh, although I had been in the Marine Corps for three years, uh, it, I explained that to her that it was like, you know, I was going into service for, for a short period of time. At some point, Lou, you at one sufficient confidence of Joe Bonanno to go over to visit his home, mm -hmm. him at his home in Tucson. In all these meetings, I tried to portray myself as uh, a very close friend. Uh, like, for example, one time uh, when he came to uh, Lodi and he saw the agency, and I was driving him back to my apartment. He uh, was sitting in the car next to me, and I said, uh, you know, there's something that uh, I, I would like to say, but I, I don't want to uh, bother you. Uh, he said, no, go, go ahead. He was always very polite to me. And I said, uh, you know, my dad came from the old country, and, and uh, I said, there's a lot of mannerisms and things that you do, uh, uh, just like my dad. And, I said, my dad, as you know, passed away uh, uh, a couple of years ago. And, and uh, I said, you're like a, a second dad to me. And uh, he, he was very uh, pleased that I felt that way towards him. And, and it was a continuing uh, uh, process of uh, using everything that I could think of to get close to him.
and uh, the resemblance of his mannerisms and my father's is like a jackass and a, a human being. But uh, again, I, I used everything. It was just a continuing uh, process of, in my mind, of uh, getting close and closer and closer to the old man because I felt that's where the uh, any intelligence information would come out from uh, the old man. It had to, by this time, be taking a little bit by surprise, didn't it, that you had been really uh, getting a lot further than the advice that the FBI uh, tended to indicate you would be. Uh, yes. Uh, the position you'd be in, including the uh, stay in his home and now going out to dinner with him. Did this have any special effect on you? Did you see this as giving you more opportunities to do something? Well, I just felt that I was getting close enough to him now that things uh, would probably start happening. I even volunteered uh, when, they, uh, when I knew that I was going to Tucson to, uh, to have a Nagra. I said, uh, I won't be able to remember everything. I said, uh, why don't you give me a Nagra and uh, I can change the tape and, and uh, pick up anything that's important. They said, no, no, it's too dangerous. They wouldn't, they wouldn't let me do it. But so I was willing to do because I wanted to nail him. But I, I always tried to use everything and, and probably the hardest part for me was to try to keep my mind going uh, uh, three steps ahead of him and yet remember everything that was said so that I could tell Bob uh, uh, in a, I call him a, like a debriefing session, uh, everything had happened because I, I, I didn't have any tape or anything and it was all by memory. How was the case coming now at, at this point in time? Was the FBI satisfied with the way things were going? Yes, the FBI was satisfied, and uh, I was very disappointed because I felt I was failing. Although I turned in, I guess, 67 names of people uh, across the country that were involved with the Banana family, uh, most of them they had never heard of before. And uh, I think it was uh, probably in uh, November or or uh, the, yeah, it was in the month of November of 1978 that uh, they wanted to uh, close everything down and pull out the uh, monitoring devices in the apartment. And Bob and I uh, talked about it, and uh, I wanted to continue because uh, I hadn't succeeded yet. And I felt that something was going to happen before too long. And uh, I said, well, we, we've got to keep it open. We can't close it down. And Bob spent hours writing, re you know, a report and all the reasons why we should stay open. And so, uh, again, we got uh, the okay to leave it uh, in operation for another uh, couple of months. So then in January, they uh, came in and said, okay, this is it. This is January of uh, uh, 79. They said it's uh, the end of February. It's closing, period. No more reasons or anything. It's closing because they felt that they'd overextended themselves to a degree and they were right on the borderline of whether we should continue the operation and they wanted to close it. They had not made a decision at that time as to whether they would prosecute or not based on what they had or? Oh, well, they, uh, they didn't have adequate information they felt uh, to, uh, to do anything. And uh, so then they were trying to figure out, okay, how are we going to get Lou out of this situation? Well, I had two heart attacks back in uh, 75 or 76. So they thought they would uh, set up a fake heart attack and uh, to get me out and uh, they wanted to uh, subpoena me before the federal grand jury to to uh, as another reason to get me out and I said no I don't want to go before the federal grand jury because they said then there'll be 19 more people that'll know what I'm uh, what I've been doing and I, I said I don't want to do that so I uh, I thought about it and I said well all right Send me the subpoena. I changed my mind. I said, uh, might as well get this thing over with. Uh, 
do it and do it right, then that'll give me a reason for calling the old man. So uh, on the uh, morning of the 15th of February in 1979, uh, I was served the subpoena to appear before the federal grand jury. Everything was formal and legal. So uh, I went to the office that morning and I called uh, the old man's home and he said, what are they looking for, the records? Well, when he said that, I don't know why, but it triggered in my mind the fact that I did sell uh, a Cadillac for Bill Bonanno and uh, he wanted all the money in cash because the, uh, I guess the Treasury Department had his uh, three companies uh, uh, banking or checking account uh, secured and uh, the car was registered to one of the corporations and uh, he wanted all cash which I uh, gave him, and he had to sign all the receipts and everything, so I was protected. Uh, then uh, I mentioned this. I said, the only thing that I can think of is this car, and I explained it to him that, that he wanted cash and, and uh, the reason why, and uh, I said, that's, that's why I called, because I, I didn't know what to do. He said, well, you, you cannot discuss this with the grand jury because you'll hurt the boy. And uh, he said, uh, we discussed it a little bit more, and then he said, uh, can you pull the records? So when he said that, I knew I was getting on solid ground. And I said, yes, I can pull the records. He said, pull them and burn them. I said, fine, I'll do anything you want me to do. You know that. And just built up his confidence. And uh, I never asked him for what or how he wanted me to do this. Uh, I let him tell me what he wanted because I did not want to uh, get involved in entrapment, which uh, had been discussed with me many times. That I had to be careful not to lead them into something that they had to bring, up, bring it up. And once they brought it up, then it was open territory for me. So uh, we discussed the uh, uh, the records, and uh, he asked me uh, several times to uh, to pull the records, to destroy them. It wasn't just a casual remark, and and uh, I would play. I'm a little hard of hearing anyway, but I played a little hard of hearing and had him repeat several times that he wanted me to pull the records and destroy them. Uh, so he did repeat, uh, yes, he said, pull the records and destroy them because it'll hurt the boy. That ended the conversation and I took the tape out of the uh, recorder in my office and uh, went to Stockton and went up to Bob Anderson's apartment. On the tapes, if there was anything important, he always made a duplicate. So he asked me, he said, uh, should I make a duplicate? I said, well, I said, you might as well, there might be something on there that would be important. And uh, so he uh, was uh, duplicating the tape and we were listening to it. And all of a sudden he jumped up. He said, you've got him, you've got him. <laughs> he was excited, you know, as much as I was. And uh, and then uh, in the uh, uh, the next couple of months, we, uh, of course, were able to get Jack DeFilippi on perjury and uh, obstruction of justice. Uh, uh, I think there were seven counts uh, against uh, Jack DeFilippi, and I think they have him on five. I'm, I'm, I could be off one or two charges, but... Uh, uh, then uh, on uh, April 5th, of 1979, I uh, did go before the federal grand jury, and I did testify. Now, when, would, when did the trial take place? Well, uh, it started uh, probably some of the preliminaries in uh, uh, towards the end of May of 1980. And uh, 
I went down to uh, to testify uh, and get ready for the trial uh, probably uh, the first week in June. And the uh, prosecuting attorney uh, was getting uh, the dates that he was going to cover and wanted me to refresh my memory and and uh, going over the uh, the evidence that we had. Uh, then he uh, he looked up at me and he said, uh, "Lou Peters, he said you're my biggest problem." And I said, "What?" He said, "You're my biggest problem." He said. Uh, how in hell am I going to explain you to the judge to convince him of everything that you've done for the Bureau? He said, I could walk up and down the streets of America for 10 years and would never find another Lou Peters. Lou, did you have any special feeling after the, your testimony was over, four long days? How'd you feel when you came down off the stand? I felt great. Testimony was all over. I felt great. And when the judge brought down the verdict on September 2nd of uh, 1980, uh, he did state in the, uh, in the report that uh, the evidence and the testimony of uh, Lewis Peters left no doubt to the guilt of both Bonanno and Jack D. Filippi, which kind of made me feel good. Lou, as you look back, is there anything you would have done differently? Uh, the only thing that, uh, uh, one thing that I would change uh, when they asked me uh, if I would uh, would work with them, I, uh, I would have said yes instead of waiting to the next day. Uh, as I told uh, uh, one of the attorneys at the Justice Department, I, I, I couldn't understand why they uh, terminated it because they could use that same evidence uh, six months down the road uh, because I felt I was very close and with them knowing that uh, I had this information, I. I pulled all the records, uh, I did what they wanted me to do, and uh, I, I kind of made a, a statement to the old man that, uh, well, this should really bring me into the family. He said, Lou, you're already in the family. Uh, and they didn't mean just friends. Uh, it was... Uh, I was looking for something bigger than just obstruction of justice. And I, I felt if I'd have had more time, I, I could have gotten something more concrete, heavier, that maybe they'd have dragged him from his home instead of calling him on the phone and asking him to come down, which surprised me. Uh, it's, uh, he is 74, 75 years old. But he's also a killer, a murderer. And the hurt that he's created for people across the country, he doesn't deserve any sympathy. He doesn't deserve anything but the punishment that the law requires based on the conviction that he's ha has received. Lou, let's talk just a little bit about the, the nature of the beast. The organized crime family. I, I feel that, uh, well, during the case, I, I said to Bob Anderson, I said, uh, who, who came up with this organized crime? And, and he said, well, what do you mean? I said, who came up with the name of organized crime? And uh, he, he was puzzled by my question because it's, uh, it's a, a term that uh, the Bureau and the Justice Department use for any white collar worker, uh, uh, that's involved in uh, illegal activity or a group of white collar workers. And uh, he said, well, why do you ask that? And I said, because I think they're the most disorganized group of people that I've ever met in my life. I said, no wonder they go broke because by the time they make a decision, you could lose your business. I said, I make my decisions 
quick and fast and today, not sometime down the road. Uh, I, I was, that was the biggest thing that I was totally amazed with their total disorganization that they have. Maybe it's their way of being very cautious and very protective, and, but uh, that's the thing that almost made me a nervous wreck, is to get them off dead center and get them moving. You talked about uh, your contacts with FBI agents, in particular Agent Bob Anderson and the rapport that you two developed over the years. What kinds of things did Bob and other FBI people indicate to you which helped develop your confidence in, in them? They are very sincere, uh, caring about me as an individual. I would come up with some really wild ideas about, because I wanted to nail them. And they were always very protective of me, making sure that my safety was always number one on their list. And when I would meet agents, they had a very sincere uh, feeling about me, uh, caring, uh, were pleased to, to work with me because I was really trying to do something that they've been trying to get businessmen to do all over the United States. There's a time, I believe, when you have to stand up and be counted for, and uh, I agree that I probably uh, went the extreme, but that's my way of life. When I tackle something, I believe in going at it 100%. Who, when decisions were made during the course of the investigation, were they joint decisions? Yes. You would participate in them, and yes. sometimes what you would... It, it was more of a, like a round table discussion. Yeah. Not all of them, but most of them. Anything that was, you know, really important or would have a, some effect on me personally, uh, it was always discussed uh, ahead of time. and and. Uh, the general path that I was to take was laid out. And, uh, but I, I always was made, felt, uh, made to feel that uh, I wasn't just another citizen, that they, uh, they really cared about me. And if the same thing happened again and I knew the results, or I knew of someone else having the same problem, I would still go to the FBI. Suppose a businessman were to come to you and ask for advice. What kind of advice would you give him, Lou? Well, I, I believe that 90% uh, of it would be covered in his own mind because uh, if he felt that it was the right thing to do, he would know what to do. Uh, he would have the feeling inside that uh, I have a responsibility. Uh, depending on how deep he wanted to get involved, I suppose. Well, even if he got involved just on the periphery, at some point he may have to go public with that cooperation. Does that change things in terms of concern for one's family, safety? Well, I, I suppose it would. Uh, I wanted to go public for uh, one reason, which I've already mentioned, and that is that I would hope that businessmen across the country would stand up and be accounted for. And if these animals came into that town, that they would at least call the FBI to let them know they're here. Uh, they may be nervous and they may be scared, but not half as nervous or half as scared as if, the, if these people actually did get in that community and took control of City Hall and took control of the police department. They'd have more problems than they would ever dream could exist if they didn't stand up to do what's right. When I 
when I heard the news of the uh, conviction that they were both found guilty, uh, I felt that uh, all the time and all the waiting and all the effort was certainly worth the effort because uh, of the conviction. And I was very proud of what I did for my country. On September 2nd, 1980, Joseph Bonanno and Jack D. Filippi were convicted of conspiracy to obstruct justice. Bonanno was sentenced to five years in prison. D. Filippi, also convicted of perjury, was sentenced to two years in prison. On June 12, 1981, in Sacramento, Lewis Peters received the Attorney General's Award for Meritorious Service. Assistant Director Roger Young presented this high commendation as Lou's family looked on. I was very proud of everything that I did for the FBI, and I'd be very proud to do it again.